my talk this morning is going to be a little bit different than the ones we've seen earlier today because it's a pilot scale study and it's more preliminary work that we're doing that I want to share with you. And I'm not going to talk about cows, we're going to talk about pigs. Uh, most of you know that my work is usually uh, with broilers on litter and emissions from that. So I'm supporting the emissions component of this project, which is actually led by uh, Dr. Mike McLaughlin. <clears throat> And others that are involved in the work are uh, Dr. John Brooks and Dr. Artisher Adeli. And we're all located at the uh, Genetics and Pre Precision Agriculture Research Unit at the uh, Agricultural Research Service at Mississippi State. Now, why do we want to compost? Well, for one reason, it's as old as Dan Miller. Oh, I'm sorry. My slide says dirt. It's as old as dirt. But seriously, though, uh, we've been composting for centuries so that we can recycle organic material back into the soil. And uh, other benefits are that it destroys pathogens and uh, converts nitrogen from ammonia to a more stable form and uh, also reduces the volume of waste. And as the swan population continues to increase worldwide, this means that we've got more pig waste uh, that needs to be dealt with, and we'd like to do this in an environmentally uh, sound way, economically re uh, re realistic way, and a socially acceptable way. And primarily what our project deals with um, is the environmental, environmentally sensible component of these aspects. But we do see in the literature that um, composting to manage swine mortalities has increased from about 10.5% to 36% uh, from 1994 to, uh, to 2006. So I think that would tell us that it's also economically realistic and, and socially acceptable. So did you know that the daily manure output of a pig is approximately 6% of its body weight? That just seems like an interesting fact to me. Um, <laughs> maybe that's not a good thing. Uh, in various types of uh, 100 sow units, though, this would uh, equate to a range of fresh manure produced from about 600 to 2,800 kilograms per day. And those might be um, grower phase operation, or farrow to suckler, or farrow to wiener pig. And we're seeing that single phase uh, production is replacing farrow to finish operations. So we have another type of waste, though, that we want to deal with besides what um, is coming from the pig itself, and that would be mortality. And in the U.S., uh, swine farrowing facilities routinely compost their daily mortality, mortalities <laughs> using open static piles. And uh, the amount of that annual mortality for a thousand sow farrowing to finish farm could be 20 tons, and that's, as I said, we're moving away from those uh, facilities. That was 1998, so a little bit older data there. But um, we're recently, for a 2,000 head finishing operation, you might expect just over two tons of mortality per year. So the purpose of our project is to improve practices to dispose of swine farrowing mortalities. And we see our composting shed here uh, to the bottom left in the picture. And this is where we're storing uh, sawdust in front of the end here and litter, uh, broiler litter at the end of the shed. And our pilot scale project is actually located at the opposite end of the shed where you uh, can't see. And the shed actually contains uh, four composting bins on each side. And at our farm, uh, it's a sow nursery farm. And we have about 380 sows with uh, approximately 3,500 piglets. So particularly, our objective was to compare sawdust and water, which is the farm standard, to other mixtures where additional carbon and nitrogen are supplied by roller litter or swine lagoon effluent. And in these pictures, you see um, a little uh, preview of what our uh, setup is. And along the lines of our objective, we're going to assess the potential risk and benefits of adding boiler litter and swine effluent to compost by comparing nutrient levels, um, bacterial pathogens, their survivability, and gaseous emissions. 
So a little bit about our methodology. We're doing this in two different ways, and I'm only going to present some of the data uh, from both of these um, methods. So here you see a um, photoacoustic multigas analyzer that we can obtain concentrations of ammonia, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. But I'm only going to present the ammonia data today. And what you're seeing is tubes coming out of the back of the ANOVA to uh, one of the flux chambers that is in the bin. This uh, silver upside down bowl here is actually the flux chamber, fondly known as a helmet. Um, but I don't wear them. <laughs> but it's outfitted with some uh, recirculation tubes so that we can use the ANOVA. And we um, do that measurement for approximately five minutes, recirculating to the chamber and um, sampling each minute. So we're doing this in these uh, 227-liter heavy-duty plastic recycling bins that you saw in the picture. And we have three repli replications of four treatments, and those are sawdust and water, the um, farm standard, and then sawdust litter and water, sawdust and swine effluent, and then sawdust litter and effluent. And um, what we do is we have a particular amount of the bulking agent which is the sawdust, and then if we're using sawdust and litter, we go one-to-one -one on a weight basis. So we do have some variability there um, due to the raining on the piles outside and different moisture content. So that's, that's uh, some variability that we may address uh, in future studies. But in the picture here, you can see um, the, the crinkly brown is a bulking agent mixed with the uh, liquid, and then the, the pigs are buried within the mix. So the parameters that we looked at uh, as far as nutrients go are carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, manganese, sodium, copper, and zinc. And then you can also see the microorganisms that we looked at. And I'll only present uh, some of the data that we have obtained today. But we're looking at clostridium, perfusions, E. coli, listeria, salmonella, gram-positive, and gram-negative bacteria. Also, we measured uh, temperature and moisture of the mixtures. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we uh, looked at emissions of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane uh, via gas chromatography, which is uh, similar to the GraceNet methodology in that we sampled at a time 0, 15, and 30 minutes from, from the helmet. It's got a port in the top of it as well besides the um, recirculation tube for the ANOVA. And then there you see the gases, all the gases um, measured on the ANOVA. And our measurement dates were from March to July of last year. So here is a picture of the final compost product, just to start off the discussion of results. And we see that we've got the sawdust water and then the sawdust litter and water, sawdust effluent, sawdust litter and effluent. And we can see in the second and the fourth piles that you get a little bit darker color from the addition of the litter. So here's what our um, temperatures look like. And we see, well, I can see. I don't, the people in the room can't see, bless your heart. But the uh, Red and green lines are the treatments where boiler litter was included, and we are getting our peak compost temperatures from those two treatments. Also, we see the ambient trucking along down here in the gray stripe throughout um, the experiment. And what we would like for composting uh, temperatures is 55 to 65 C uh, to destroy pathogens or maybe 45 to 55 C so that you could get a maximum biodegradation. And our max temperatures are 37 to 43 C. So we're a little bit uh, low on that. Just a little bit about the nutrients that we measured, the carbon to nitrogen ratio at the start and the end of the experiment. Uh, we see we've got, as we would expect, a lot more carbon material in the uh, strictly sawdust bulking agent. And the uh, litter treatments are here around 21 and 20 and are, are pretty stable to the end where you have that greater reduction, uh, biodegradation of the sawdust treatments. And I uh, just wanted to mention that we had 
approximately 15 grams per kilogram nitrogen added with the boiler litter treatments. Just a little bit more about the nutrients. We did see um, initially more phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, manganese, copper, and zinc present in the boiler litter treatments, and only sodium appeared similar among all the treatments. As far as the recovery of bacteria goes in the clostridium, um, we did see significant differences um, with uh, greater levels in the two effluent treatments when the experiment began, but at turn one and at the end, there were no differences in, in these numbers. Also, within each treatment, there were no significant differences over the times, which were the start, turn one, and the end of the experiment. For the gram-negative bacteria, there were no uh, significant differences among the treatments at any time. Um, and the only exception to that within the treatments were that the sawdust water levels decreased over time relative to, to the gram-negative bacteria. The gram-positive bacteria, there were um, significant differences at the probability of 0.001 with greater levels in the boiler litter treatments. And then within the uh, sawdust effluent treatment, there was no significant change over time. But in the other treatments, uh, the levels decreased over time. Now, relative to the emissions, they were uh, not measured continuously, but intermittently. And you can see these were the times that they were measured. Each 24 hours for the first four days after the start of the experiment. Then again, each uh, 24 hours for four days after turn one. And turn one was one month after the start of the experiment. Uh, at turn two, which was two weeks later, um, two weeks after turn one, we did it each 24 hours for two days, and then at the end of the experiment, which was approximately four months after the start of the experiment. For the ammonia, uh, we see very little flux uh, for the sawdust only treatments, whether it's uh, combined with water or the effluent, and then in the blue and the white um, columns we see here, which are the white is the uh, sawdust litter water, and the blue is the sawdust litter effluent. We see we're um, up to almost 40 milligrams per meter square per hour on the first day. And then we sort of peak out on day four at around 100. Then when we move on to turn one, we do see a little bit of ammonia coming from the sawdust water treatment here in the red, the first column. And then again, we have uh, more ammonia flux from the uh, treatments that include litter, and then that's peaking after about two days after this turn one. Then at, uh, after turn two, which is on your left, and then the end of the experiment, which is on your right, you, we barely are seeing any ammonia activity at all. And for the um, greenhouse gases, Nitrous oxide first, uh, we see we had uh, no activity um, at the uh, start of the experiment. At turn one, we are seeing some nitrous oxide also at turn two, and these are slightly greater in the litter treatments. Then in the middle of the graph, we're looking at carbon dioxide. We see that initially, as we did with the uh, ammonia in the first four days. And then we're also seeing some uh, carbon dioxide activity at turn one and two weeks later at turn two. And again, these are, are greater in the litter treatments. And then for methane, um, finally over on the right, we are seeing a little activity at initially. But the, uh, you, I'm not sure if you can see the uh, magnitude here. Um, we're less than 0.25 milligrams per meter square per hour here for the um, sawdust effluent treatment. And then in some cases, uh, such as sawdust and water, we're at 0.002 is our, our greatest uh, on the scale there. So 
I want to conclude by saying adding roller litter to the sawdust at this one to one weight to weight ratio increased our compost, compost temperatures after aeration, which was the mixing and turning. Also, um, the litter addition increased some levels of nutrients and bacteria, but changes in levels were uh, not consistent. The ammonia, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide emissions were high after early aeration, but the um, methane emissions peaked a little bit later. And finally, uh, we know that composting offers an environmentally sound disposition of these byproducts and manures. And we fully expect our aha moment to occur as we com complete a few more replications and uh, evaluate the trade-offs among our parameters to develop uh, best management practice. I would like to acknowledge our technical staff who uh, help complete all the measurements that we do. Rhonda Cornelius, Renata Smith, Cindy Smith, Mary Hardy, Tim Fairbrother, and Walter Woolfolk. Also, our farm owner for being so uh, generous in cooperating with us. And then I just wanted to show you these couple of um, references where I've gotten some of the introductory material. Thank you. We have not added moisture. At, at that time. We've, we've had some trouble with wetness we've, um, because of the we've had so much rain on the piles outside, so we have not readjusted moisture because the farm farmer doesn't do that. Uh, April would like to know what the effluent is that we use. It came from the Swine Lagoon located right there on the property. Dan would like to know how the ANOVA and the gas chromatography measurements compare, and that's something that we're continuing to work on. We have different time frames there just because of what we can fit in in one day with using the ANOVA to step from each uh, bin to the next, and, and so we're working on that. The question is why did our temperatures not reach the optimum temperature uh, that we would like for composting and to uh, dispose of pathogens. And I don't know why that is. Yes, I did not show you the moisture content, but we did measure that uh, continuously throughout the experiment. And, and we saw a, a decrease in moisture content, but it was not a significant decrease over, over the time. Some of our future um, Experiments that we're doing are different aeration rates, and so we might at that time do, like Andy said, we may need to add more moisture throughout the uh, process. He would like to know um, how I can conclude that we have reduced these pathogens, although we did not have the optimum temperature. And we are measuring those pathogens, and as I said, we're trying to optimize our process so that we can get the optimum temperatures. So I'm not saying that we have killed all the pathogens. I just know that's the ideal for uh, a good composting. 